வணக்கம் அண்ட் நமஸ்தே ஜெஹிந்த் எட் அன் அதர் எபிசோட் ஆஃப் தி ஆசாதிகா அமிர்த் மஹோத்சவ் சீரீஸ் இன் விச் we are looking into the lives of men and women who have contributed to the independence of the country friends today we shall start with a great woman when i say great woman and a great contributor to the cause of nationalism some of you might have guessed as to whom do i mean in 1857 there was an unrest demanding home rule or independent rule of the country this agitation which had been recorded by the british authorities as the sepoy mutiny was justifiably renamed the first war of indian independence by none else than vinayak damodar savarkar karl marx subsequently recorded the 1857 agitation as the first war of indian independence whenever we talk about 1857 and about the first war of indian independence the name of jansi rani comes to every mind she has been called jansi rani and there are people in this country who have named their daughters jansi rani in fact jansi is the name of a place and she was the rani of jansi and hence the name jansi rani who was this great lady rani lakshmi bai that is how she has been addressed Rani Lakshmi Bai was born on the 19th of November 1828 in the town of Varanasi Varanasi is a sacred town to all those born in India Varanasi indicates many sacred things to many of us and one of the sacred things that can be associated with varanasi is the birth of rani lakshmi bai in the very town itself her original name was manikarnika of course people called her mani and manu when manikarnika was just about 4 years old her mother died and she enjoyed the affection of the father her father worked for the peshwa peshwa baji rao the second of the bithur area the peshwa was also fond of manu and often called her chabili the word chabili means something beautiful manu was so beautiful and such an intelligent child that the peshwa took pleasure in calling her chabili manu was home tutored she was taught to read and write and growing up in a household where the father was at the services of the peshwa she enjoyed freedom and grew independent of so many things that children are normally dependent upon 
At a very young age, she learnt shooting, horsemanship, fencing and of course Mallakamba. Mallakamba is an art, it is a kind of an art, martial art where the performer has a stick in hand and performs various kinds of courageous activities. And Manu grew up so well that she even overtook her father's expectations. She was intelligent and she had different approaches when it came to even mundane activities. She was not a normal child. She was different. She was above normal. She had a unique perspective and even at a tender age, she would advocate social reforms and would fight with the neighbours whenever social justice was at stake. Quite soon, Manikarnika was married to the Maharaja of Jansi. Maharaja of Jansi at that point of time was Gangadhar Rao Nevalkar and Manikarnika married him in May 1842. It is customary in many parts of the country that the name of a woman gets changed once she gets married. So now Manikarnika became Lakshmi Bai and this name Lakshmi Bai was chosen by her husband in honor of the goddess Lakshmi Devi or Mahalakshmi, the goddess of wealth and prosperity. Maharaja of Jansi felt Manikarnika would bring in prosperity and wealth not only to him but to his entire land and so named the new wife with that name. In September 1851, Lakshmi gave birth to a boy by name Damodar Rao. Damodar Rao was the son of Gangadhar Rao Nevalkar and Lakshmi Bai. In other words, the prince born to the Maharaja and the Maharani of Jansi. Unfortunately, this small little boy Damodar Dao died within about four months of being born. The Maharaja was grief struck, the Maharani as well. However, they could not control their grief and after some time decided to take another son in adoption. According to this decision, the Maharaja and the Maharani adopted a child by name Anand Rao. This Anand Rao was the son of Gangadhar Rao or the Maharaja's cousin. They renamed this adopted son Anand Rao as Damodar Rao, recapping the child who was lost to nature. However, the adoption process and the renaming process were notified to the British authorities and the British political officer who was stationed in Jansi. Friends, a little flashback here. 
those days that is in the 1800s the east india company had political agents stationed at different towns and cities especially capital towns and important towns of important provinces so even in jhansi a british political officer was stationed and the maharaja gave a letter to this political officer saying he had adopted a child in place of the child which was lost and has renamed the adopted child with the original name of the child dead the political officer received the letter just kept quiet did not do anything further however soon after that is some time in november 1953 the maharaja died just before his death also he notified the political officer that the child damodar rao will be his political heir and legal heir but until such time that the child grows up the maharani will be the ruler and the government of jhansi should be given to this widow rani lakshmi bai on the event of the maharaja's death the maharaja was ailing and so was expecting that he would die and that is why he made pre arrangements and sent the letter to the political agent however things changed when he died the british east india company refused to accept the legality of the adopted son some of you might remember that there was something called the doctrine of lapse the governor general dalousi had brought in this rule called the doctrine of lapse according to this doctrine if any province or kingdom loses the king or the ruler and then there is no biological heir to the ruler the kingdom would be annexed by the east india company what a way to gather land and territory the kingdom will lapse the territory will lapse because there is no biological heir no direct heir to the ruler who was deceased in other words the doctrine of lapse refused to recognize adoption so anand rao who had been renamed as damodar rao was not recognized as a legal heir or a legitimate child to the maharaja and the maharani and the east india company rejected damodar rao's claim to the throne since that claim was rejected the claim that the rani would rule as a regal representative was also rejected however when the british east india company tried annexing the territories of jhansi to itself rani lakshmi bai gave out a clarion call she said i shall not surrender my jhansi she said main apni jhansi nahi dungi i shall not give it up i shall not give it to you i shall not surrender my land between 1853 and 1854 there were some talks the political agents were trying to on one side appease 
the British authorities on the other side try to kind of talk some words of submission and some kind of appeasement to the authorities on the side of the Rani. And by March 1854, the East India Company intimated Rani Jansi that she would be given a kind of an annual pension. The pension amount was rupees 60,000, 60,000 per annum and she was asked to leave the palace and the fort. You get the situation, the Rani will have to leave the palace and the fort and she will be paid some purse as a kind of a pension. She has retired and she is out of the rule, she is out of the fort and she has no claim on that rule or on that land. But then the Rani was not prepared to leave. It was after all her land by marriage and she had the moral responsibility to look after her citizens. Remember, she was named Lakshmi primarily because the Maharaja thought this Rani would bring in prosperity to the people. When this was all happening in 1854-55, when she was being asked to leave the palace, she refused and she was staying inside. Sometime in 1857, the Sepoy mutiny or the independence agitation broke out in Meerut. That was on the 10th of May 1857, otherwise called the Indian Rebellion. When the news of this agitation reached Jhansi, the Rani sent word to the British political officer. The British political officer at that point of time was Captain Alexander Skeen. She intimated that she be permitted to raise a battalion of armed men so that she can have protection herself. Skeen agreed to this. Jansi was relatively calm amidst all that which was going on in Meerut and other places, Meerut, Kanpur and the surrounds. There was some kind of a regional unrest in the summer of 1857, but though that entire region was a little agitated, Jansi was comparatively calm. In fact, Rani Lakshmibai even conducted a haldi kumkum ceremony with all the pomp that it could have for all the women in Jansi. This was her way of telling her people, don't worry, I am there for you and you are guaranteed with safety and security. Remember those days during the freedom struggle, many of our men and women celebrated most of the festivals. We have already seen even in London at the India House, people like Veer Savarkar, VVS Iyer and so on celebrated the Dashara, celebrated the Vijayadasami, celebrated the Deepavali. These were occasions for all the Indians to meet. Similarly, even in the Indian soil, people celebrated these festivals, not only for worshipping the deities, but then these were occasions where people could get together, talk to one another, express their views and reassure each other. Rani Lakshmibai's way of reassuring her subjects was to conduct a Haldi Kumkum ceremony and tell them, don't worry, I am here for you. In fact, sometime until 1857, we should remember, when the Indian rebellion was breaking out, 
Rani Lakshmibai did not have the mind to oppose the British. She was not for war or violence. She thought the British authorities would understand. In spite of the fact that she herself was asked to leave, she thought the British authorities would be in a position to understand the sentiments and the feelings of the Indian people. However, in June 1857, the 12th Bengal Native Infantry was ordered to seize Jansi. Jansi was sieged and the troops entered in and had to kind of be fought with. From August 1857, the seriousness of the siege decreased, but between June and July, there was a kind of a battle between the British troops and the troops which had been collected by the Rani. From August onwards, Till January 1858, Rani was ruling Jansi because she had won the initial wars with the troops and so she was ruling and Jansi as a whole was peaceful. She defended the entire Jansi territory against the British troops. But subsequently, again in 1858, March, Sir Rose, the commandant, laid siege of Jansi once again. By 24th of March 1858, Jansi was being attacked, bombarded, and the Rani had to seek help from elsewhere. She sought the help of Tantya Tope, but it so happened that she had to leave Jansi, go into hiding, go along with Tantya Tope and fight for the country. Friends, we all know subsequently Lakshmi Bai was caught and then she died. However, on the screen now you find the place where she is supposed to have jumped on her horse Badal from the fort. Damodar Rao in a sling on her back. Yes, that small little child Damodar Rao placed in a sling on her back, she climbed on to Badal and she is supposed to have jumped from the fort because she has to escape, go out, seek help from Tantya Tope, Peshwa and Nana Saheb and then oppose. Badal died, the horse died but then the Rani is supposed to have escaped with Damodar Rao. It is also said that warriors like Khuda Bakrish, Gulam Gauss Khan, Dost Khan, Lala Bakshi, Moti Bai, Sundar Mundar, Kashi Bai, Raghunath Singh and Jawahar Singh also went with her and escorted her. She went to a place called Kalpi where she was joined by additional forces, additional rebel forces as they are called and Tantya Tope also joined her. They were in Kalpi preparing to attack once again or rather defend Kalpi. But in May 1858, the British forces attacked Kalpi and again the Rani and Tantya Tope were defeated at Kalpi. 
Slowly, from Kalpi, the leaders moved to Gwalior, Jansi Rani, Tantya Tope, Nawab of Banda, Rao Saheb, these were the leaders and they all came over to Gwalior and joined the rebel forces or the Indian forces which were there. The Maharaja Sindhya had fled Agra and he had brought his forces to Gwalior. So they were all in Gwalior occupying the Gwalior fort but then subsequently as had happened in those times in several places they were shown off and Rani Jansi was supposed to have been captured and killed. Whatever happened to Rani Jansi, the name triggers pride, enthusiasm and motivation. All of us feel proud that we belong to the land to which Jansi Rani belonged. Even today, if someone, some girl is asked to fight against social evil, she is immediately told to be a Jansi Rani. That is what people tell her, Jansi Rani Banao and fight against social evil, fight for freedom. After Jan Sirani, we now look at another great man who fought for the independence of this country in a very unique way and his name is Lala Lajpat Rai. Lala Lajpat Rai was born on the 28th of January 1865 in the Punjab area. The area in which he was born is currently in the Punjab area of Pakistan. He had his initial education at a place called Rewari where his father was working as an Urdu teacher. Sometime in 1880 Lajpat Rai joined the government college at Lahore having completed a school education. He subsequently studied law. It was when he was in the college at Lahore that he came in contact with freedom fighters and patriots. Lala Hans Raj and Pandit Gurdat were his mentors. It was also at the same time that he was influenced by the social reform movement of Swami Dayanand Saraswati and therefore he became a member of the Arya Samaj. Lajpat Rai was so attracted to the Arya Samaj philosophy that he became the founder editor of a magazine which was started then at Lahore, the Arya Gesset. He started practicing law and he became a founding member of the Bar Council of Hizar. It was at this point of time that he was attracted to politics too. He was attracted to people's movements and became part of the Indian National Congress of Hizar and the Arya Samaj. Sometime in 1886, the Dayanand Anglo Vedic School was started at Lahore. This was the starting point of the chain of DAV schools to get established. Mahatma Hans Raj or Lala Hans Raj as he was called was responsible for the establishment of the school. Lajpat Rai helped him, helped Hans Raj start the Dayanand Anglo Vedic school. He was practicing as a lawyer we saw 
But sometime around 1914, he decided to quit the law practice and dedicate himself totally to the independence movement. Similar to what Dadabai Navroji thought years ago, Lala Lajpat Rai also had a similar feeling. He thought if he could travel to Britain, talk to the British authorities directly and appraise them of the condition of the Indians, that would help India achieve independence faster. So, he travelled to Britain and subsequently realising that he may not be able to do much at Britain, he travelled to the United States also. In October 1917, he was at the United States of America and that is where he founded the Indian Home Rule League of America. From 1917 to 1920, he stayed at the United States and mustered support for the Indian national movement. When the first world war began, he decided to come back to India. He could not stay there. So, he came back to India and participated in the civil disobedient movement in 1921. So, by 1921, when he was in India and participating in the Satyagraha movements, he was arrested and had to be imprisoned from 1921 to 1923. Friends, we all have heard of the Indian triumvirate, Bal, Lal and Pal. Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Lala Lajpatrai and Bipin Chandra Pal. The three of them worked for the national movement. Their ideologies were similar. They thought active participation <clears throat> from the people of India will fetch independence faster. Lala Rajpat Rai continued to travel to different parts of the country. He made several youngsters come into the national movement. And sometime in 1928, we all know the Simon Commission was appointed. Why was the Simon Commission appointed? There was unrest in India and demand for representation, representation in the governance. So, the British government decided to appoint a commission which would study the conditions in India and work out a solution. But what to say of what the British thought? They appointed a commission, a commission dedicated to study and survey the conditions in India and work out a solution. But then not a single Indian was there in that commission. The entire commission all the members of the commission were British. So, when the Simon Commission arrived in India, Indians protested against it. The Simon Commission went to Lahore on the 30th of October 1928. We all know there were cries of go back Simon at that time. In various cities and towns, processions were arranged, protests were arranged against the Simon Commission and there was an overall cry, go back Simon. 
So, when the Simon Commission arrived at Lahore, there was a procession of Ahimsa, merely chanting, go back Simon. It was a procession of Ahimsa, it was not a procession of violence. The protesters did not do anything, they just took out a procession under the leadership of Lala Lajpatrai. Nothing else, their only aim was to inform that they were against the Simon Commission. They did not indulge in any violence. However, the police headsman who was there ordered Lati charge and while that kind of a charge was happening, Lala Lajpatrai who was leading from the front was hit. James Scott is the name of that police officer. James Scott was so brutal that knowing pretty well that Lajpatrai was falling down, he repeatedly hit Lajpatrai with the lati. Lajpatrai was bleeding from his head, injuries all over the body. He fell down and as he fell down, he said, you are beating me now and all these, you know, every hit that falls on me is the hit on a nail on the coffin of the British rule. He said the British rule is being put into the coffin, the end of it and as the coffin is being nailed, remember each hit on me is a hit on that nail. However, he was taken to the hospital, but then he succumbed to the injuries and died on the 17th of November 1928. October 30th was the procession, just about 17 days later, Lajpat Rai succumbed to the injuries he had sustained during that protest procession. Of course, Lajpat Rai became a heroic name. We all know the death of Lajpat Rai triggered several revolutionary activities. We all know most of the youth who were members of the Hindustan Socialist Republic Association were pained at the death of Lajpat Rai and wanted to take revenge. And that is how all those activities by which Bhagat Singh, Sukhdev and Rajguru are well known names today started as an aftermath to Lajpat Rai's death. Lajpat Rai was also a prolific writer and he wrote several books on India, on the condition of India those days and to instill courage in the minds of people, he also wrote books on international personalities like Mazzini, Garibaldi and of course personalities like Chhatrapati Shivaji and Krishna Avatar. Lajpat Rai was a great trendsetter, a man who withstood all that brutal hit for the sake of the country. From Lajpat Rai, let us go 
to yet another great personality and who is this personality? Friends, many of us would not have heard her name also. That does not mean she was not great. She contributed her might to the freedom movement, though she died very young. Her name is Kanakalata Baruwa. She was born on the 22nd of December 1924 in Assam. She belonged to a very poor family and had nothing else than poverty in her childhood. However, she was determined to be part of the freedom movement. Her father was Krishnakanta and her mother was Kameshwari Baruva. She lost her mother when she was barely five years of age and even before she could reach 13 years of age, her father also died. She went to school but could not continue her schooling beyond class 3 because she had to take care of her younger sisters and brothers. What kind of a plight? A little girl losing the mother, losing the father and losing her studies also for the sake of looking after the siblings. However, she found some kind of livelihood. She went for work here and there, some kind of labor. And with all that wages, she was able to look after her siblings. During the Quit India movement, she joined the independence movement. During the Quit India movement in 1942, there were several smaller movements in different parts of the country. And in Assam, especially in the Gopur subdivision of Assam, there was an association called the Mrityubahini. Mrityubahini. Imagine. This association comprised youngsters who called themselves a death squad. They said they were prepared to die for the sake of the country. So they indulged in several kinds of activities where their activities would attract the attention of the British police or the British authorities and in some way they will be able to create attention and create some kind of movement. On the 20th of September 1942, the Mrityu Bahini decided that Kanakalata would hoist the national flag at the local police station. Hoisting the national flag at the local police station, there will be some kind of agitation, unrest and they thought they would create an uproar. Maybe a few of them would die, but then the entire public would turn round and the rest of them would get involved in the freedom movement so that the freedom could be obtained quite soon. So Kanakalata, true to the resolution that they had taken, collected the local villagers and led them towards the police station. The officer in charge of the police station saw the procession coming 